Hey there, YouTube, Farm Up Racing here. So this lathe was my first ever CNC conversion project. Whenever you build a project like this, you frequently forget to build in features that you didn't know at the time you needed. And as you live with a thing for a little while, you discover what you've left out. So this is Lathe 2.0. I've been spending the last few months addressing some of the faults in the previous design. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to walk you through the new features and I'm going to show you what it is I've learned and some essential features that I wish I installed in the first place. So let's go ahead and take the tour. So a bunch of the magic for Lay 2.0 happens here in the control box. Now what you can see, first off, is bird's nest back here. That's all the signal lines coming in from the control panel. Those all go to an Ethernet smooth stepper and it's how the switches and lights talk to the program and talk to mock. The x-axis driver has been replaced with a hybrid stepper, meaning that it both has a stepper motor and a sensor, a position sensor on it, so it knows where it is. And that allows the motor driver to feed it more power to get to where it's going, it's starting to bog down. And if it commands a move and doesn't get it, it can fault out, it can set a fault line high. And those fault lines are now attached to the smooth stepper, so if the motor driver faults out, it tells the smooth stepper, smooth stepper tells mock, Mach goes, holy shit, cuts the e-stop for me, and now I don't have to worry about losing steps or, or crashing if it, if it does something weird, uh, it just shuts off. When that happens though, I have these two momentary reset switches, and what those do is they selectively cut power to the motor drivers so that I can recover from a fault by clearing the fault out on the motor driver and start over without having to start over from scratch. I can continue a program that's in operation without having to reset the whole machine. And of course, I've added a green pilot light because previously, I was, notwithstanding the fan noise, I was forgetting the controller was on and was leaving it running. Now I have the light that's, hey dummy, it's still on, you need to turn it off. So that's it for the control box. Let's look at the lathe. So here's the first new important feature of lathe 2.0, and that's this limit switch right here. What I hadn't realized was having a reference on the z-axis that's the same every time you start the lathe means that having an interchangeable tool post like this that's referenced to the switch now means your tool table can work. So that means you can size all your tools, program them, and you can do semi-automatic tool changes and not have to worry about re-zeroing the tool every single time. So let's see this in action. This is a screen set operation. We just go up to where it says references all axes and it's going to go out and reference the x-axis switch the same as it always did and then it's going to move in and reference the Z. There we go. We have a little window to clear out that says it's been referenced. Click, and now the lathe knows where it is, so my tool table works. Huzzah! So this feature here, you can see it fits on top of the tool slide here. There's a little lip that comes around the side. There's these two ears that pop up, and there's a pair of bolts that go up and they press against the tool post, and it's bolted down to the slide here. What this is, is a tool post rotation stop. The idea being is that you normally you crank down the nut on top of the tool post and that provides enough friction to keep the tool post from twisting in reaction to the cutting forces. But that wasn't working. By firmly mounting a stop on the carriage and then putting these two micro adjustment bolts on there, I could very, very accurately square up the tool post to the slide and then it's locked in place, it can't go anywhere. So this gives me the ability to make sure that it doesn't twist and it allows me to, to adjust its degree of twist very, very finely to make lining it up a lot easier than playing tappy tap tap with a hammer. Let's move on to the next feature. This is another essential feature of the lathe. That's a treadmill motor. That's actually the second treadmill motor that's been on here because the first one died. The reason why it died is because these treadmill motors don't have any integral cooling. Inside the treadmill there's a big old fan that blows air through them. They don't have that if you buy them used. So what I've done is I've sealed off the back of the motor with this plastic collar and this brake duct. 
That is hooked up to a 48 volt fan up top and that blows air through and the fan is controlled by the controller so anytime the spindle is on it turns the fan on. That keeps the motor cool and it keeps schmutz from flying out here and because this is surplus race car brake cooling duct which is a silicone it can take hot metal smacking on it and it doesn't burn its way through. One of the most important additions to Lathe 2.0 was this control panel and this jog cluster here, where we have a control handle that I sourced new old stock off of an honest to god real CNC, a jog selection switch for the axis, Z axis and X axis, and then we have the speed selector and the enabling switch here, and then finally an indicator light to show when the handle is active so I don't leave it on and bump it by accident across the machine. So the way this works, this selects speeds, the light comes on as you'd expect, put it on slow speed Z axis and we'll crank it away from the chuck and it moves slowly and we'll crank it towards the chuck and it moves slowly and now we'll put it in X and we'll back away from the workpiece and it moves slowly we back in towards the workpiece and then move slowly, we'll put it back in Z, next higher speed, away from the chuck, significantly faster, towards the chuck, significantly faster. So fast, in fact, that I'm going to, this speed isn't usable. I'm going to move this speed to here, move this speed to here, and, and add a slower one, because when you're on this speed and turn it, it just kicks off. So much nicer than using keyboard jogging. You don't have to play with the screen, you don't have to touch the keyboard, you can have one hand on the handle, jumps off, spin the handle back and forth, switch back and forth on axes, and everything works, Bob's your uncle. Alright, so the next thing we want to test is we want to test the functionality of the cycle start and feed hold buttons. So we've got a program queued up that when I press cycle start, is going to change to tool 1, move the tool to just off the part at part 0, at the front of the part in Z, move down to Z minus 2, 2 inches down, where I've got a little sharpie mark on it, come back and forth a couple of times, then withdraw out to a safe distance, ask to change to tool 4, change to tool 4, go back to part 0 again, and move down to Z minus 2, Z0 a couple of times, just like I did with the tool. If this works, the tool position should clearly line up with the front of the part and the sharpie mark and it should be off the part by a little bit. This shaft is half an inch and we're going for three quarters so it should just just miss. If everything works it'll all line up, if it doesn't work it'll crash. So let's give it a try and see what happens. Cycle start. Red light comes on blinking, that indicates a tool change. Tool 1 is on the turret so we're good to go. I acknowledge the tool change. Go. There we go. There's the retract. It wants tool four. Take off tool one. Put on tool four. Lock it down. Acknowledge tool change. Go. So it worked. Okay, what happens if we want to pause it? Cycle start again. Change back to tool one. Tool one's in place. Lock it down. Acknowledge. Go. Whoop, hold up. Pause. Program light comes on solid red. That means we've paused. I've cleared whatever fault it was. Resume. Takes off again. Whoop, hold up. Paused again. Red light on. This time I want to cancel the cycle completely. A second push of feet hold. Light goes out. Program has been canceled. That works. We have a functioning set of controls. We have a functioning status light. Huzzah! So one of the nice uses of the jog handle is that now that Lathe 2.0 has a four jaw chuck on it, that means you now have to do the work of centering the part in a four jaw, which requires you to take a 
indicator, run it up against the part, and spin the chuck around looking for wobble in the indicator, and then it's progressively tightening or loosening the different parts of the chuck until it's centered. Well, with the jog handle activated, you can now go ahead and turn jog on, put it in X, I should put it in Z, jog the handle over so we're close enough to the chuck to get a decent reading, put it in X, and we'll move it in towards the chuck until the indicator picks up. Just move a couple of clicks until we're near zero. There we go. Turn jog off. And now you can do the usual procedure where you rotate that and go, okay, there's a low spot, there's a high spot, there's a low spot, so it's got to come towards. So we'll just tighten that up a little bit. That moves a little. Low spot. So that's fair. Off, tighten it up, a little better. This spot's fair. Back that off a little bit. Tighten that up. A little better. It's the low spot. Etc. I'm not going to fully indicate this part in, but you can see how much nicer it is to do this kind of stuff when you've got the jog handle, because now you can go ahead and do this without having to refer to the screen. The stuff's all here. It just acts more like a professional machine. Now let's look at another cool feature. So notwithstanding this being a CNC lathe, sometimes there's still functions you want to be able to do manually. And that's when you do things like you take some memory paper and you use that to clean up a finish or take the last couple of thousands off or you might want to file it or if you're doing drilling in the tail if you're doing drilling in the tailstock that's not controlled by the CNC all that turns on and off is the spindle and with the spindle controls being on the screen that's a serious pain in the ass so what I've gone ahead and done is added a manual spindle control you do have to set the RPM in the uh, you do have to set the RPM and the screen set before it'll turn on, but with the RPM set and the spindle turned on, you can now press manual spindle and the spindle starts. Press manual spindle again, the spindle comes off. With the spindle running, you can also use the keyboard to speed up or slow down. Just a nice handy touch for when I have to do a manual operation but don't want to be reaching back and forth, scrolling the mouse over, highlighting the appropriate things to hit spindle start and spindle stop. Just right there, click, off and go, click it again, and we're done. Of course, no manual control panel is complete without the emergency stop switch, which you see right there, and, uh, and as you can see, it's appropriately labeled. So there you go, Lathe 2.0, control panel with jogging, manual spindle, program control, indicators, and of course any stop. We have the Z-axis limit switch, which enables our tool table. We have a four-jawed chuck, which means we can now dial parts in more accurately. We have a new X-axis motor with a wider drive belt and more power, and it's a hybrid one so it knows where it is. All things that I really should have had installed before but hadn't. And of course we have some of the 1.5 features that showed up sort of mid-year where, where I have an ammeter on the spindle to act as a load indicator and I have coolant controlled by a solenoid so I can run coolant through it. So what's left? Well there is one final thing that I need to do for lathe 3.0 and that has to do with the way the motor is mounted. Currently I'm using the front of the X, uh, the original X-slide bushing, and that's not good enough. There's not enough lubrication in there, there's too much drag. So I've gone ahead and designed that, which is a proper bearing block. It fits on the front of the X-axis, 
and locates the lead screw. A much more solid and robust part and it's got a proper bearing in there instead of a bushing. Unfortunately, in order for that to work, I have to make a new lead screw and with the lathe being down while I was building the 2.0 features, I wasn't able to get that done. So that's the next step. With that finished, it's hard to imagine much more that this thing can use. And I'm okay with that because quite honestly, the purpose for a lathe should not just be making lathe parts, it should be making actual parts. Several months later. So an unintended consequence of me being lazy and taking my own sweet time producing this video was that I actually had the time to send those new lead screws out to be thread rolled. If you want to see how that went, you can see the video, the most accurate part I've ever made, which details the process of designing, producing, and installing that lead screw, showing the final result. For now though, the lathe is done. And that means I have the bandwidth to take on a new project. So of course, I'm going to build a CNC mill. Stay tuned for that. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Ding, ding around one. Ding, ding.